Hey, so this, uh, my name is Karthik. Uh, I work for a company called DocAI. This is your website up there. The reason why I have it up there is just to kind of give a bit of context in what we're doing at DocAI. Uh, so DocAI is trying to accelerate medical research by allowing uh, participants of medical research to collect their own data and contribute to research study that directly impact them. So one of our first data trial, uh, which is what we're calling clinical trials on the phone, are, uh, is the allergy data trial uh, with thyroid. And what we're looking at in there is symptoms and lining it up to um, air quality, for example. And the context that specifically what we're trying to show is it's actually feasible now to start collecting all this medical data dust that you leave in your trail with, you know, with your doctor, with 23andMe or Ancestry.com, which is the genomics data, or Ubiome, if you've ever used Ubiome. It's a microbiome processing where you can actually send samples uh, that w they will process to see what kind of species of bacteria you have in your gut. And all these put together create a very holistic picture about any participant, which is very, very helpful for researchers that are looking at uh, a specific symptom or a specific response to either drug therapy or treatments that were actually put out into the public. So the name of the game that's starting to happen in a lot of medical research is real-world evidence. And what I remember from my master's is that it's very, very difficult to onboard and recruit participants and even have them give any sort of deep information. Take, for example, a clinical trial for chronic pain. Most people would drop out by about week two, week three, just because of the fact that it's too painful for them to finish the questionnaire, come into a clinic on a weekly basis or a monthly basis and finish a questionnaire. It's just not gonna happen. So we need to start changing how we think about medical data and specifically change how we think about how uh, the re uh, medical research in the future is gonna look like. And this is one approach, it's probably not the only approach. Uh, and what DocAI is trying to do is bring the concept of understanding medical research outside of the lab and bringing it to the hands of the participant. And this is very important to the talk that we're gonna be talking about next, which is the focus is changing the user experience around genomics and starting to make it personal. That's where the personal and the personal genomics come from. You have your 23andMe data, you can get your raw data in SNP format. What does that mean? What can you do with that by yourself? You, or do you have to get a processing pipeline to understand that data or the value of that data? That's not feasible right now. So th what I want to show you today is how DocAI is sort of tackling that problem and how we use Spark to accelerate uh, what uh, participants get out of their genomics. Um, so first, I'm just going to go into a very quick uh, you know, introduction to personal genomics, what's happening in the industry, and as... The moderator, uh, I forgot your name, sorry about that. Uh, but moderator was telling us the data for genomics is growing very quickly. We'll talk about why that's happening and what does that mean in terms of processing, what are some of the challenges. And then we're just gonna jump into what the traditional pipeline looked like right now uh, in labs and how we can start accelerating that to make it application ready uh, in the case of actually making it personalized to individual participants. So very quick. Precursor, your, everyone has DNA. DNA sequence has a, uh, four different types of nuclear, nucleotide. ACTG is how they are actually presented. There's about three billion bases for humans, um, and we're actually starting to find out now that there's a lot of different uh, locations in the genome that interact in very complex ways. And this becomes a little bit more relevant in the future. Uh, the, type of data that most people have access to today from 23andMe and Ancestry.com is something called SNPs, which is a single nucleotide uh, polymorphism, which basically means variations in specifically nucleotide sequences. Um, so if you're looking at the diagram at the bottom there, suppose one chromosome has an AT pairing, another uh, person could have a, a CG pairing, and that's a variant that we would see in a specific SNP. Uh, SNPs right now, the way they're processed, they're only about four to five million SNPs, and, but there's more than 100 million different types of variations for genes across the population. So the Human Genome Project showed us the vast amount of scale uh, that, would, that is 
in the human DNA in the entire population. Um, they just weigh too many different types of variations to create essentially a complete catalog. And this becomes relevant in the future, uh, in, in uh, future slides. Um, so, you know, now we can, get to, uh, we can go to 23andMe. It costs about, uh, I think it's like 20 bucks now to get a kit. You send it in. And then what you can get out of these SNPs is uh, looking at relevant traits. Do you have an attached earlobe or not? Sorry, non-medically relevant traits. Do you have an attached earlobe or not? Uh, are you a long distance, are you an endurance runner or not? And all of these are soft predictors. Um, because there's a lot more that goes into predicting, for example, your endurance than just your genome. But this is one part of the picture. And sometimes genomics um, sells itself as a very clear picture of what's possible in terms of phenotyping, which is presentation of genes, but it's not necessarily the case. However, it can tell you a lot about, for example, ancestry, and which is one of the analyses that we're going to look at today. Uh, ancestry works really well, specifically because we have uh, quite a few projects that have been done in the past that tells us what are common variants that we would like to, we would see in a population from Asia versus a population from uh, Europe. And this kind of allows us to start looking at ancestry in a very unique way. Um, the other thing we can also start looking at is medically relevant data, which is the carrier risk. For example, malaria becomes very uh, um, transparent when you look at SNPs. Uh, a lot of different types of diagnosis become easier, especially when, if doctors have access to SNPs data that's analyzed. So there's a lot of value here, but there's also a few issues that we have. So for example, right now when you're decoding uh, personal genomic information, what you have to understand is that most publicly available, uh, quote unquote, um, market-ready products like 23meancestry.com do genotyping. And that means that they look at specific areas within your genome. And so imagine your complete genome as, you know, um, 300 million base pairs, sorry, um, uh, 30 million base pairs. So it's like a long string of ATG, um, uh, essentially. And out of that, because they can't sequence all of those, what they would do is look at variants that they know are either medically relevant or speak to a specific application and pick those out. The problem with this, however, is that you miss out a lot, right? Uh, what used to be the understanding for genetics is that uh, there was a lot of extra cruft built into the genome. Um, and what I mean by cruft is like, this would be used to protect the genome from accidentally having mutation by having just a lot of buffers uh, within the sequence. But now what we're starting to learn is that some of these buffers are actually very, very important to understand uh, complex diseases. Um, there's different pieces of genes that interact with pr producing proteins um, that we just don't get out of genotyping today. Um, so that led into a new type of technology that's becoming more and more accessible now, uh, which is called sequencing, which is the full genome sequencing and also getting something called the exome. And the exome is the craft, which is what I was talking about before. All this extra stuff that we used to ignore before. And this is becoming more and more accessible. So what does that mean? The cost of uh, getting a full genome uh, sequence, uh, I know the, um, the, fly, the graph is a little bit small there, but basically, uh, if you follow that blue line, it goes from about 100 million at 2001 to 2017 being about $1,000. Someone could afford that today. I got my whole genome sequence, and now I have access to my ex exome and my entire uh, um, uh, genome sequence. Sorry, <laughs> that was a little bit of a repetitive. Um, but what's happening now is the ability to actually get genome, uh, genotyping done at a uh, faster scale uh, with personal devices. Uh, there is, for example, a technology called Minion that allows you to actually uh, plug in a device with a USB into your laptop and you can put a blood drop in there and it can get genotyped. The accuracy may not be great, but it's starting to show the signs that anyone could get any genome uh, sequence very, uh, sorry, genotype very quickly. Uh, the same thing's starting to happen with sequencing, right? We have next generation sequencing coming out, more data, more context, we're starting to learn a lot more, a lot quicker. So we're starting to discover um, just more about the 
capabilities of the human genome and the interaction that they have with diseases, with traits, with symptoms, with phenotypes, with microbiomes, and this is going to lead to a lot of um, new research. But the problem with this is we're going to have we're going to have a lot more data, right? The data, the scale at which the data is growing now is. Uh, starting to become a little bit exponential. More people are getting their data sequenced multiple times, actually. Um, more of that data is actually becoming uh, put together into public data sets that helps us understand uh, clinical risk. Um, and as more of this happens, it's going to become harder and harder to actually process this. Um, so one way we're processing genome, uh, genotype sequencing right now is trying to make it accessible to participants, as I mentioned earlier. And the way that works right now is um, a user will go to 23andMe, um, you know, get, download their raw data, which is a text file, uh, which has an ID for the specific SNP, which is the variant, and what is the type of variant. They can upload that to our app, and I'll show you, show you guys a demo, um, which right now is using uh, Spark and Databricks to run very simple jobs, uh, just because we're, this is the first time we've actually done this, uh, which is using a few clustering algorithms to figure out ancestry. Um, which is then put back and interpreted for the, uh, for the user on the phone. All this right now happens in about eight uh, minutes, and I'll show you guys a video uh, in a second of how that works. Um, right now, 23andMe, for example, will take up to 24 hours to get your ancestry data back. Um, there are a few challenges here, and I'll get into that next. The accuracy of the variant calling, which is determining what the SNPs are, not what you would say um, uh, production grade in the sense that if you were working in any other data field right now, you could qualify and quantify the quality of your data. You can't really do that with genotyping yet. That's because there's a lot of stuff missing and a lot of vendors have been putting in proprietary uh, SNP formats. Um, so this is the challenge that we have, uh, which is one of the reasons why this is called an MVP. Uh, we're looking at the early type of analysis that we can do to do uh, uh, to start seeing how we can do, um, how we can start to improve those uh, public data sets. Um, this would be a traditional pipeline. The traditional pipeline is uh, once you get the variant, you start actually manually run, uh, running a lot of bash scripts. Because in the past, uh, and if you remember the exponential curve, there just wasn't that much data to worry about automating this. There wasn't no need for big data. Uh, I mean, this wasn't a problem. Even with uh, genetic-wide association studies, which are studies across several hundred and several thousand participants, you, someone could just sit that, uh, you can just get a grad student, put a laptop in front of that, and then tell them what to look at, and it's done, right? You know, why do you need a Spark pipeline? Uh, but that's starting to change now. And what that pipeline looks like, and we actually ran this, uh, is on the side you'll see the bash script, uh, or the command that we ran to get this working. Um, to set this up, on your grad student's computer, you would have to download quite a few number of tools, um, get that working, you have to get the right versions of everything working. Uh, the pipeline runs are all manually executed right now. You have to play around with the parameters uh, to see if you're getting a good quality intermediate data format that you can then uh, start to interpret. And all of those verifications are done by hand. Uh, this makes reproducibility and rely, uh, the reliability of those analysis very hard to track. Because um, the reason being, if one grad student ran it one way and didn't take any notes in terms of what parameters were used, the next grad student working down the pipeline wouldn't know uh, what are some of the mistakes or what are some of the parameters that were used in the earlier scripts. This makes it hard to test. And when you're working in a space like medical research, you need to be able to show how that data was analyzed to a principal investigator. So this started to not work for us. Um, and we definitely couldn't future-proof this because as more participants were coming on for more data trials, we couldn't run this manually anymore. So we could automate some of this, but it just became way too tricky. Uh, so that's when we started looking at, you know, how does it impact the user experience? Um, let's say someone uploads your, any file. Anyone, anyone can upload an image, for example, to, uh, to the app. Uh, if there's no quick verification of this, uh, the user assumes that they uploaded the right file and they don't get any feedback if they're valid or not. And they just go on their way, they come back, and they're like, oh, there's no analysis, and they mistrust the product. So this, is, this was completely infeasible for us. We needed to provide 
uh, feedback back to the user that what they gave is actually correct. So verification is almost impossible to do with the traditional pipeline. Uh, also, if the jobs are running, for example, as cron jobs, where these batch scripts are running, more often than not, 60% of the time they would fail, either because the RSID couldn't be found or the variant is unknown or whatever it is. Um, we couldn't track any of those. So that, that means the operations become very particularly difficult. Um, finally, like we couldn't put this on any of the modern uh, sort of uh, microservices platforms that we had, and that m basically means that the scaling became very uh, very difficult for this. If he had 50,000 SNP files to process, we, someone would have to actually probably run them manually with the current, uh, uh, the traditional uh, GATK pipeline. So that user experience completely sucks. That means that participants are less likely to come back to upload more genetic data, uh, and it also leads to implications in the medical research itself. So we had some design and product considerations we had to look at. So one of the things that we wanted was transparent processing. We wanted to know how, a user wanted to know, for example, how long is it taking? What should I be expecting? Should I be waiting for something? Should I just go away, come back next week? What does that look like? And these are notoriously difficult to actually track. Uh, I'll talk about how we did some of this with our pipeline, uh, uh, with, sorry, with uh, Databricks job runs. Uh, API. Sorry, one second, I just need some water here. Um, the other thing is, when, fi uh, when files were being uploaded, we don't want to send that down through processing and find out later, after getting halfway through, that the file was completely incorrect. So we wanted to do very quick file verification. Um, and that means that we could actually completely asynchronize the upload from the actual process. That allowed the user to actually go away and come back. Um, this wasn't possible before, and this was uh, actually something that made the user experience particularly nice. Uh, the other thing is we wanted to actually see, you know, how does the real world raw data actually interact with all these analysis and what we can continue to improve. And so we wanted to see the results for the job and be able to actually inspect what failed. And this is one of the reasons why the uh, Databricks jobs on top of notebooks was very valuable because each of the runs would have the right parameters that we can rerun and see what was failing and change the code right there. Um, that was uh, amazing for us. Um, and then the question was like, you know, how do we do this with an app, right? And that the, uh, we're going to show how we do that. The other the other big problem that we had was with the traditional pipeline. If you had a large number of files with a lot of variations in uh, the file sizes, we couldn't guarantee. Uh, for example, a batch process of multiple jobs because the data formats, are, uh, the data, si uh, data size for each one of the files are different, so we couldn't standardize the processing. Another thing, we couldn't, as the, because the user was going to be uploading th this through a mobile app, there's no way we could have asked them again to upload it if you lost the data. Um, so this was very critical for us. And again, scale became an issue. Uh, you can't scale on a bunch of bash scripts. It's just not going to happen. So we wanted to be able to just, you know, click a button and just throw more clusters at it. And this is where Databricks really came into, uh, uh, came into our consideration for the product. So let's go into it. Before we get into the processing, we kind of have to look at what ingestion looks like. So what, what you're seeing uh, from left to right is sort of the, the pipeline for actually collecting the data from the user. So the user has a bunch of VCF files. They upload it. That goes through the mobile app. And then at that point, when it actually hits our pipeline, uh, which is called Unimatrix, Star Trek fans out there from Borg, uh, but if no, no one knows it, that's fine. Um, and what this pipeline does, it actually takes the file format uh, as a data frame, verifies it through a few, um, uh, probably I think about 50 verifications that we have uh, to check that the file actually makes sense. You know, um, d because variant call formats are, are text files, anyone could make up anything, and we actually sometimes pay research participants for this data. So it's notoriously likely that someone's just going to try to mine, you know, Amazon gift card points out of this process. So we wanted to verify as quickly as possible. And we actually do this without processing the file, which is very, very nice. That means we don't have to hold a bunch of data somewhere, check it, and then send back uh, something to the front end. Um, and this basically means that as soon as they've uploaded, it's verified. And if it's not verified or verified, it terminates the TLS. 
Um, so that means that the bandwidth being used on the phone is as uh, small as it needs to be. Once uh, we've actually done that, this, become, that, this made the user experience significantly smoother. I have a video of this in a bit, and I'll show you guys. So now, once the pipeline actually has verified the file, at that point, asynchronously, it stores it on our uh, Google Cloud storage, uh, which is very similar to S3. Um, so now that we have the file, how do we actually turn it into a data frame? This is a simple snippet. Uh, it's a text file. It's not anything specific or, uh, you know, it's not anything crazy. Uh, the schema is very simple, RSID, which is the ID of the variant, uh, what chromosome and position it's on, and what's the genotype. Um, these things are just consumed. Uh, there's just a little bit of processing that happens there. Uh, and then what we do is just put it into a data frame. This data frame then is combined with whatever is running that batch of uh, um, multiple uploads and then used to actually process into either ancestry or longevity or whatever, the, uh, uh, whatever analysis needs to be done. Um, once we have that data frame, uh, we actually uh, start the job um, by triggering from the, data, uh, from, the, uh, from the Unimatrix pipeline, we actually just call the REST API to run the job. Uh, this, we originally thought we were going to have the job running regularly, and then we realized we just weren't getting the cadence that you would expect for a regular job run. Um, so we're like, screw it, let's just call the REST API. This turned out to be beautiful. This turned out to be very, very fast, um, because what that meant is the pipeline could continue to run even if it failed. Uh, that means the data engineer could go look at the job, fix it, run it without the user even knowing about it. This turned out to be very beautiful and really, really handy. Uh, the results are then stored back to GCS. The analysis itself is essentially just the k-means cluster around uh, uh, our reference data set. And I'll show you guys what that looks like, what the reference data set looks like. Um, once those uh, results are in GCS, that triggers something back to the Unimatrix pipeline, which then puts it into the, uh, to a Mongo database for the front end. Um, the great part about this is because the job REST API actually tells us what the expected time is and what the actual runtime is, we can actually send a progress uh, we can actually send the progress back to the front end, which they can actually show to the user. So the user can decide, you know, hey, this is taking too long, something's wrong. We can actually measure that now, um, which where uh, previously when you were running that manually, you couldn't do that. So what did is, what is the code for this look like? I had to shorten this down. There was this SQL statement at the bottom was particularly big, but I'm just going to walk through what that looks like. Um, so there, um, there are a lot of public data sets that were created by the Human Genome Project. Um, and several other projects that were combined to create something called a frequency map. So the frequency map actually tells us, uh, given a variant, uh, how, uh, what is the frequency of variants from specific locations in the genome you would expect to see in different populations. Uh, we did a few, uh, of, uh, we cleaned up that data quite a bit uh, for modern populations, and using that, what we can actually do is turn that into a lookup table where then we take the user's data, the user SNP data, turn it into um, uh, a hash for that lookup table, and just join that with the ancestry analysis. There is a few, few more steps in between, but essentially that's the nuts and bolts of it. It's not a complex job. The most difficult part is actually maintaining that data for the reference data set. Um, because quite often what happens actually, uh, when, my, when we tested with my data, I actually came out to be Finnish, 90%, and I don't look Finnish. So we had to actually go clean up that reference data quite a bit. Um, but what that goes to show is that these pipelines can be very simple. Compare that to a couple slides ago where you're running this. And over here, you're running maybe seven lines of code and two joins uh, across some tables that you're updating. This is very, very easy to work with, right? This is not complex. You could open source this. Other people could build on top of this. Um, it doesn't take a lot to figure out what's going on here. Um, and this is great. And let's take a look at some of the results, right? So the first one, I'm trying to do this. Uh, yeah. So this is what the failure looks like. You know, you go to 23me, you browse, and you find something in your iCloud, and you upload that, and the verification was done in less than probably 200 milliseconds. 
that's great for user experience. The threshold at 200 milliseconds is when users start to think something's wrong. So this was perfect uh, for failures, and this is what it looks like uh, when you're doing the ancestry analysis uh, with a valid file. Um, yeah, so you upload the file, and what's actually happening right now is the pipeline that I talked about earlier. Uh, once the file is actually uploading, you actually start seeing the progress bar. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here. Uh, yeah, so it actually starts to analyze it. That means the job kicked in. We send back the signal directly to the front end. Um, that means the upload is complete. The user can now uh, actually turn off their phone. They don't need to actually keep their phone open at all. Uh, this is great because sometimes these analysis can take a lot longer, especially when we start to do medical relevance analysis. So this kind of tells the user, you know, how long would it take? That's about, uh, I would say, max one or two minutes compared to uh, how long it would take, where about 24 hours to 48 hours to run the same analysis. And usually what happens is when the uh, uh, genome files come in, um, there's a lot of verification that happen after the fact. Because this is a medical app, we can't send out data that we don't stand behind. So there's a lot of assertions that happened uh, right after that file was analyzed. And if any of those are false, we actually don't send the data back to the user. Uh, in the traditional pipeline, that would have to be manually verified by uh, a person looked up to see why the assertions are failing, figure that all out, and that can sometimes extend the time to up to a week to get the analysis back. Uh, so that's what that looks and feels like. Oops, why is it running again? Um, so, uh, what I wanted to talk about is, you know, where we're going next, right? So I talked about, um, I talked about, you know, uh, genotyping and sequencing, and we, uh, sorry, one second, my bad. Cool. So, uh, in, right now we've only had VCF files to work with. But what's starting to happen now is more and more people are getting their full genome sequenced. And there's a lot more clinical trials that are actually asking for that data to be enroll, to enroll participants. This, uh, this data is going to actually explode very, very quickly. We won't be able to handle it even with the, uh, sort of the pipeline that we have now. So there's a new piece of technology that's coming out. Uh, it's actually available now on Databricks. You have to get a life sciences add-on to your Databricks account. And this uh, DNA sequence pipeline actually takes samples uh, in something called BAM format, which is the raw, complete genome sequence with the exome, and allows uh, and creates a very user-friendly implementation of it in Spark that allows uh, data scientists to work with. Um, the, the paper, uh, this is the paper. The other thing that this actually helps I'll get around is some of those vendor lock-ins that we were talking about. So 23andMe and Ancestry, um, because some of the SNPs that were relevant for some of the analysis, so for example, if you go to 23andMe, uh, they'll give you like, you know, risk for uh, cystic fibrosis. Some of those SNPs aren't actually available in the public data, uh, public reference files. So they would have to name those SNP files RSIDs themselves for their thing. So the raw data, that I, the raw data that you're getting from 23andMe and Ancestry.com, sometimes you'll have SNPs that are not publicly known, right? So if you go to the website, uh, SNPsDB, you can put any RSID in there, and it would tell you what that SNP is. However, the, we don't know all the SNPs out there just because there's so many. Um, so what that led to is um, about 5 to 10% of SNPs that come back in the raw data format are incomprehensible to people outside of that company. Uh, and so this leads into a little bit of a vendor lock-in. It's not anyone's fault, it's just the way it is, just because there's so many SNPs out there. Um, so what this allows us to do with the full genome sequencing is actually get around uh, uh, variant calling in a way where we can actually, if we don't know the SNPs thing, we, uh, if we don't know the SNPs, we can just send that raw data uh, to uh, through a pipeline and just have, for example, um, the ML figure out what that relates to. Um, this is very exciting. Uh, for example, Google just released um, a product called Deep Variant, uh, which allows you to actually use uh, full genome sequencing and use uh, um, and treat that as just pure data. It doesn't care about 
you know, variance, it doesn't care about location, it doesn't care about loci. All it does is actually turn those into variants. If it can't find the variant in SNPDB, it just marks it. And you can decide what you want to do with it. So the principal investig in investigator getting this genetic data can actually look at, hey, this is potentially a new variant that we don't know about, and this class of, uh, this population is interacting with this drug completely differently. That's very, very exciting in, phar uh, in pharmaceutical. That's either a new product or a risk that they haven't seen uh, in, the uh, in the drug before. Um, the other thing that you also get out of uh, going directly with, um, uh, uh, going directly from your sample to your analysis and skipping variant calling uh, is you can actually, um, sorry, I'm just lost my brain there. <laughs> uh, uh, you can actually use that data to start understanding how those cruft or those exomes interact with the variant that you're interested in. Um, so if, we, if over here we collected everyone's um, uh, full genome sequence, we can, right now, we could do uh, something called a genetic-wide association study. Uh, gen genetic-wide association studies help you find, help researchers find correlations across uh, phenotypes and uh, the genotype. And those, uh, those type of studies are notoriously difficult to do because not everyone gets the data the same way. But if you start from the raw data, it's a common ground to start from. If you just sample everyone the same way, now you have the same data processed the same way and not pre-processed with any sort of vendor or any sort of tool. Um, and now you actually can run a genetic-wide association study in this room. Um, so that's why it's very, very exciting. And that's why I'm very, very excited to share this with you. And I'll take some questions. Thanks, Kardik. That was really helpful, insightful. Uh, for anyone who has questions, I'd line up or come up to this microphone. Um, you mentioned that uh, as part of your pipeline, you were skipping uh, variant calling. Could you Sorry, elaborate? I, uh, I'm a little bit deaf. Just yell at me. Oh. Um, you said as part of your uh, as part of your pipeline, you were skipping variant calling. Could you talk more about what the methodology was behind? essentially skipping uh, GATK best practices or not just using GATK4, which uses Spark under the hood? Um, I'm sorry, I'm still losing you quite a bit. Just can you, can, can you just like, sorry, just yell at me. Yeah, Louder so um, could you, you, you mentioned during the presentation that you were skipping doing yeah. variant calling. Yeah. Um, and, but uh, I, I, was like, I was wondering why, like wh if you could explain like why you were doing that and like what yeah, your methodology absolutely. behind it was. So, and why you didn't just use something like GATK4, which uses Spark under the hood. Absolutely. So we're not going to, so just to clarify, uh, what I mean skipping variant calling is not just to, uh, not to skip the process at all. We'll still be doing variant calling, but there's going to be, as we get more and more data, we're going to find new SNPs that no one knows anything about, right? They're not in SNPs DB. Uh, so what do you do with this data? Right? Well, we're going to have a lot more exomes that have never, be, never been seen before. There's new types of populations that are uh, emerging uh, as there's a lot more intermarriages happening, for, uh, intermarriages happening uh, across uh, boundaries now. So those type of uh, data wasn't available when the human genome uh, project happened. So what do we do with that, right? Uh, one of the things uh, about AI, and especially with a lot of deep neural networks, and Trust me, I'm a bioinformatician. I don't believe a lot in deep neural network, but one of the things that it's very, very good at is finding patterns. And so just imagine a full genome sequence, it's just a text file, maybe five to 100 megabytes long. Shove that into a deep neural network and give it the phenotypes and see if these SNPs are actually relevant to your application. Um, that being said, the variant call format that, or the variant calling that was already done in the past it's not going to be replaced. We already know that stuff. So this is a way to start augmenting uh, beyond that. How do we tackle new real-world data sets that we're seeing that no one's tackled before? It's going to happen more and more. There's just way more data. Does that answer your question? Hey, uh, very interesting uh, application. So the mobile app, I, as my understanding, is more like consumer-facing. Yeah. Uh, what does it sound like using this towards medical practitioner? 
Like yeah. doctors are going to be more likely to use this on a daily basis. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, there, is, uh, there is another app that DocAI has out called the Gene Wall. Um, it is available. We are actually repurposing that for physicians. And uh, there's, it's going to come out in the next couple months or so. Um, so uh, what's happening there is um, there's a bit of a difficulty because not everyone is a genetic counselor in your care team. So um, what needs to happen um, in my mind over there is that uh, when physicians are looking at, uh, you know, uh, someone's SNPs data or someone's full genome sequence, I think there's going to be some common ground that needs to be found to make it understandable for physicians. I don't think we've tackled that yet, and I think that's a very difficult topic, um, but it's getting closer. Uh, the one big problem that we found around that is uh, get, staying up to date with literature, right? Uh, when academic literature comes out about any specific um, pharmacogenetics interaction, um, there's uh, there, there takes a little bit of time since once the paper comes out to actually understand it in, from an analytical perspective. And ma then making that uh, understandable to physicians is difficult because most physicians don't go to a training of computer science or bioinformatics. Um, so there's that translation that needs to happen there. But we are working on a few things. We're working on a, a medical machine learning course that uh, is going to be given to physicians to see if, you know, how can we get them to a point where they can look at someone's, uh, you know, microbiome data or their genome data or, you know, their symptom track data? Um, how do we make that understandable to them? Um, I don't have an answer yet for that, but hopefully at some point we figure that out. Yeah, because I, I agree that's going to be very valuable, very, very valuable to physicians. Hi, uh, <clears throat> thank you for your presentation. Um, just real quick, what are the, you mentioned um, the size of like somebody's, what is it, VCF and then the whole sequence, what are, what are kind of size yeah, are so we talking about? Just so. They're not particularly big, I think, um, I don't know off the top of my head, but they're like 8 to 10 megabytes, they're not, because they're uh, small snapshots of the uh, genome, right, they're not the entire genome, um, so they're not particularly big, yeah. The, the whole sequence, they can, they can be particularly big depending on the person. The, the range is kind of wide, so it can go from uh, 50 megabytes because it depends also on the device that's collecting the full genome. And then you can, if you get the full exome and the full genome, I believe it can go up to 100 megabytes or so. Yeah. But I, like, don't quote me on that. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. <laughs> Write it down, publish it somewhere. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify something about the, the product, Doc AI. Is yeah. It sounded like the goal was to eventually calculate polygenic risk scores and do some kind of predictive work. Yeah, we're shying away from that just because it's a nightmare. Uh, yeah. Anytime you see one number telling you risk, that's usually not true. Um, so what we're actually trying to do is making that data available to the PI and letting them decide. Right? We're just trying to get the data clean enough so that a principal investigator could look at it and decide if they want to actually include that data in the post-analysis of that study. Um, polygenic risk scores are notoriously hard to get right just because you know, things are changing so quickly. Um, we're working with um, Dr. Shirag Patel from Harvard who's done a lot of work with the NHANES data set. The NHANES data set is one of the longest longitudinal data set of air quality, uh, diseases, pretty much a lot of things. Um, and they have a risk score that they use, but it's really hard to qualify that. Populations are changing, environment is changing very quickly. So if I gave you a risk score on data sets from the 1970s, would you trust it? I probably wouldn't. Um, so maintaining that is very, very difficult. But that being said, though, as more literature becomes available, it may be possible for us to start looking at risk in a probabilistic way rather than in a, def a deterministic way. And what I mean by that is like probability of your risk score being correct times your probability of that risk actually being true. Um, I'm simplifying a lot of things there, but yeah, I, I think... I don't have enough time to get into polygenic risk scores. I may be very opinionated about those, yeah. All right, thank you. <laughs>